And I'm going to, without further ado, I'll introduce John Reiskin, who will get us going in today's program. Thank you. Thanks very much. I'll introduce myself, uh, John Reiskin. I spent the morning uh, with a few of my friends going through the Spiders Alive exhibit at the Natural History Museum. I recommend that to you. And um, this afternoon, we're talking about the Nobel Prize again. And this time, I'm going to begin talking about the Nobel Prize week and some of the ceremonies. And then we'll dive into the Economic Science uh, Sciences Nobel Prize. The full name is up there. Let me just give a, a disclaimer. I had in college, I had one course in economics, and I, I, re I read Paul Krugman regularly. And that's my background in economics. But this year's Nobel Prize given to three laureates we'll talk about um, is a, a, a very understandable element in, in, in economics, and we'll be talking about that. So um, first, I want to talk about the ceremonies in Stockholm. Incidentally, next week, we'll be talking about the Peace Prize, which takes place in Oslo. So this is the last of the Stockholm Nobel laureates we'll be talking about. And the Nobel Peace Prize is awarded on the anniversary of Alfred Nobel's death on December 10th. But there's a whole week of activities that take place in Stockholm preceding the 10th of December. And we'll be going over that a little bit. Um, Nobel Week events. There are a series of events. Uh, one of them is the Nobel Week Dialogue. It's a day-long symposium on a subject with participation of former laureates. And in this year, it was on the future of life. Started with the definition of life and then a whole variety of speakers. Goes on for six, seven hours. And, um, and it's available uh, if you're interested. Um, also during the week, uh, two days before the event, the big event is the concert at the uh, Stockholm Concert Hall. And we'll see that hall in a few minutes. Then during the week, each of the laureates gives a, about a half an hour lecture on their subject. And so we will be looking at one of them at the end of this talk. Uh, the economic laureates gave their lectures uh, on the 9th of December. Then there is a, a very interesting thing uh, called Nobel Minds. It's a roundtable discussion uh, among some, but not all, of the laureates of that year. And it takes place in the Royal Palace, in the library of the Royal Palace. This year it took place, or this time, on the 9th of December. And it was broadcast by Swedish television and BBC. So they have that arrangement. And uh, all of many of these elements are available online, incidentally. And finally comes the big day. The December 10th is an award ceremony at the Stockholm Concert Hall and the Nobel Banquet at the Stockholm Town Hall or City Hall. And it's something to behold, which we will now behold. Um, this is the uh, Concert Hall. And we're going to look at two elements. The, the ceremony lasts about an hour and a half. We're going to just look at the um, the uh, the entrance of the laureates, uh, preceded by the entrance of the royal family of Sweden. And so uh, once we begin it, uh, we will get to that. And we are waiting. That's so now it shouldn't be more than a minute or so before the royal family, uh, King Carl Gustav and Queen Sylvia 
enter the room. Together with Crown Princess Victoria and uh, Prince Daniel. Mozart, we will have the laureates entering on stage. in physics 2022 professors Alain Spe, John Klaus and Anton Zeilinger.
now we're going to uh, look at the presentation of the diploma to Ben Bernanke, one of the economic Nobel laureates. A long ceremony. Composer Ida Moberg, who amongst other things was engaged in women's rights. And now time for the economics prize. Your Majesties, your Royal Highnesses, esteemed laureates, esteemed laureates in economic sciences 2020 and 2021, ladies and gentlemen, for thousands of years, the roofs of fine castles and churches have been plated with copper. Both the concert hall, where we are now, and the city hall, where we shall dine and dance, have copper rooftops. But before the party starts, please join me on a journey to the past. We land in Stockholm, almost 400 years ago, in 1624. Sweden is the champion of copper production. Since the government wants a higher copper price, it launches the copper coin. Two decades later, wanting to raise the value of copper once more, the government introduces the copper plate coin. Instead of using silver for big payments, the government urges the use of large minted copper plates. The $10 plate weighs almost 20 kilos. It is the bulkiness of the copper currency that breaks the resistance to banking. In 1657, Stockholm Banco is open for business. For the first time, Swedish merchants can deposit their currency in a bank and settle payments with a stroke of a pen. No longer need they break their backs carrying heavy copper plates around the city. Soon, the borrowers are even happier than the depositors. Stockholm's Banco st starts to lend at better terms than Stockholm's traditional moneylenders. But already in 1660, Stockholm Banco experiences its first bank run. The government triggers the run when it suddenly decides to mint new, lighter copper plates. Since older plates with the same dollar imprint have a higher copper value, depositors rush to get their old plates back before someone else does. The bank must halt lending to the distress of borrowers seeking to extend their loans. Many of them must sell assets at fire sale prices. After a second run, a few years later, the bank goes under. What to do? Can't deposit banks lend liberally without risking a financial crisis? Sweden's solution is to start a new bank, governed by the parliament. In 1668, with deep pockets and at arm's length from the government, the world's first central bank is born. From 1668, let us stride 315 years ahead. In 1983, Douglas Diamond and Philip Dibvig develop a fundamental theory of banking and bank runs. The theory says that any ideal financial arrangement promises each saver instant access to her funds, yet channels most of these funds to long-term projects. However, 
the ideal arrangement is fragile, just like Stockholm Banco. Preventing bank runs requires public regulation, such as deposit insurance and emergency loan facilities. The very same year, Ben Bernanke discovers how bank failures affected the Great Depression in the 1930s. His analysis of historical records and economic statistics reveals that bank failures were costly mainly because of broken ties between lenders and borrowers, not because the money supply fell, as we believed before. Their professors were Nanke, Diamond, and Debuy. When the great financial crisis hit us 14 years ago, your theories were vindicated. Where the banking system was more robust and better regulated, the crisis became milder. Recent reforms bear the imprint of your lessons. Just as copper rooftops shield us from bad weather, these good laws will shield us from financial storms. It is an honor and a privilege for me to convey to you, on behalf of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, our warmest congratulations. May I now please ask you to step forward and receive your prize from His Majesty the King. The presentation of the speech was by Professor Tore Ellingsen, Chairman of the Committee for the Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel. That was actually instituted by the Swedish Central Bank in 1968. And first laureate to receive this year's economics prize is Ben Bernanke, also known as a former central banker himself. We should get to the next slide in a moment. There we are. Let me just point out, um, we can turn the light, well, I can turn the lights up a bit. Um, notice white tie is required by every man there. And um, it's quite a fancy occasion. Um, it's followed in the evening with a banquet for 1300. And I have some pictures here that are relevant, though this one I stole from Getty Images. Um, and um, but this is this was the main course um, for the evening in in 2022. Yeah, from Okamic, they, they they basically supplied the food. Um, I wanted to say something about the Princess Victoria um, when her brother, her younger brother, was born. Soon after his birth, in 1980, they changed the laws of succession so it's strictly primogeniture uh, independent of the sex and so she is the crown princess even though she has a younger brother crown princess of sweden uh, congratulations sweden, women's Go. <laughs> that's right <laughs> so that that introduction by the chair of the bank that that um, awarded uh, the Nobel Prize to these three economists uh, summed up what I'm going to be talking about beautifully. So let's move on. Here's the uh, here's three in cartoon fashion, and they all won together for research on banks and financial crises. That's a very euphemistic term for panic. Panic is the term used for financial crises um, until just before uh, World War I, and it is an appropriate term. The uh, financial crisis, or pa I just love the word panic, uh, refers to a sudden, drastic, widespread economic collapse. All at once, people become convinced their money or their investments are at risk and rush to the institutions holding those assets 
In the case of banks, it's called a run on the banks, which was described. Unable to pay back all their customers at once because banks are not mattresses. The money is used in other ways, so it's not always available. The institutions go bankrupt, starting a domino effect that often brings down, but not always, the whole economy. The possible serious consequences of a financial panic is a recession, which is defined as a period of temporary economic decline during which trade and industrial activity are reduced, generally identified by a fall in gross domestic product in two successive quarters. That's the definition of a, a recession. If it lasts significantly longer, it becomes a depression. Uh, and of which we've experienced uh, in the United States about six depressions uh, over its uh, 225 years of however long we've been around. Um, it's a severe and prolonged downturn. The depression may be defined as an extreme recession that lasts three or more years, uh, or which leads to a decline in real gross domestic, uh, domestic product of at least 10% in a given year. These are the formal definitions that are used when describing these events. I wanted to talk about some panics. This is a, an odd one, but we often see it referred to as the tulip mania in uh, 1630s in the Dutch Republic. Uh, suddenly, tulips became very popular and, and considered of great value. Um, and this one the, that's pictured here, the Viceroy, uh, was for sale uh, between 3,000 and 4,200 guilders. Uh, and so in order to put that in perspective, a, a crafts worker, uh, a successful crafts worker, makes about 300 guilders a year. So in order to put it in, into my mind, I said, well, let's say he made $50,000 a year. So there were tulips, single bulbs selling <clears throat> for $500,000 or more. Um, the panic part was the collapse of the market when suddenly people either lost interest or the color of the tulip wasn't all that great. And um, this is called uh, the, the bursting of a, of a speculative bubble and the subsequent crash in the prices. In this case, it didn't affect the Dutch economy at the time significantly, but it surely had an impact on all those individuals who had bought the bulbs at 3,000 guilders, and now it was worth perhaps a few guilders. Um, so um, I, I think they're still looking for the black uh, tulip, which would have been worth even more. But there have been in this country, those definitions, uh, about 48 to 50 recessions and six depressions in the history of the United States from 1776. Many of them resulted in what was actually was called panics. And the panics of the years I list there were actually called the panic, especially panic of 1873 and severe ones. Some of them led to recessions and all of these led to recessions and a few to, re to depressions. The last recession by that definition that I gave you was the COVID-19 recession lasted two months February to April of 2020, a minor uh, recession. And they come fairly regularly. Um, but notably, the ones we think of uh, include the Wall Street crash of 1929. And this was a situation in where many people owned stock. In fact, I, my, my grandfather wrote his autobiography and he described in the late 20s, even he bought some stock. He was a modest owner of a hardware store. And, uh, but that you'd buy them by off paying 10% of its value 
uh, you know, and in order to it, and uh, since the stock market kept going up, feel, people felt that the uh, value of the stock would go up, and then you sell it uh, and make money. But suddenly, everybody realized that maybe there wasn't all that much worth. Uh, a bubble burst, and um, suddenly. Uh, there was a rush to sell this stocks. And if you only own 10% of it, but you were obligated to pay the rest, you were, you gave up your stock and lost every penny you put into the stock market. It started in September and ended in mid November when the share prices on the New York Stock Exchange then totally collapsed. And this led to the Great Depression. The other notable one is one that we experienced about 15 years ago, and that's the United States housing bubble, a real estate bubble affecting over half of the US states. And it was, it was the impetus for the subprime mortgage, which was mortgages that were given to people who were not fully qualified to pay back the mortgages, and then as some of you, I don't even remember the movie about it. Then the mortgages were put into new, to new instruments of exchange so that they piled good mortgage borrowers with poor mortgage borrowers who, uh, and packaged them all and people didn't even know what they were buying. So there was again, a collapse leading to a severe recession and what we call the Great Recession. And the Great Depression and the Great Recession reflect uh, the last hundred years as, as pivotal moments in the history of banks and how we treat them. The Great Depression of the 1930s paralyzed the world's economies for lots, for many reasons. And we will hear from uh, Dr. Bernanke on this a bit. However, we have managed subsequent financial crises better thanks to research insights by our the laureates this year. They have demonstrated the importance of preventing widespread bank collapse and those of other financial institutions. So they all wrote their papers back in the 1980s. So this is interesting about Nobel Prizes in general. Nobel Prizes sometimes are for innovation like CRISPR and uh, modification of genes and things like that, that have occurred only in the last couple of years or maybe 10 years ago. But others go back and look at seminal, seminal works. And in this case, uh, they went back to a paper that Ben Bernanke wrote when he was 29 years old in 1983. And that's long before he was chair of the Federal Reserve in those years. Notice those years overlap completely the beginning of the Great Recession. So he was able, from an academic perspective, to apply some of his theories and his models to getting out of the Great Recession. And if you remember, any of us are old enough to remember what the scary moments that was. It happened at the same time as we had a presidential election, et cetera. So a more general statement, banks are the intermediaries that direct lenders' monies to appropriate borrowers whose enterprises will stimulate the growth of the economy, returning increased income to the lenders. Panics are the result of the loss of confidence or trust in such institutions. It doesn't have to be a bank. It could be an investment company like Lehman Brothers and others that uh, suddenly found this loss of confidence, which have the it leads to the run on, on the banks, et cetera. To avoid panics, the banks must maintain the trust of their lenders and borrowers, and that has been accomplished by legislation 
that produce pragmatic regulations and rules and establishing the agencies to enforce them. So many economists, I just point out another disclaimer, and that's the problem I have with economics, is that many economists have offered theories about how financial crises develop and how they could be prevented. And there's oftentimes no consensus, and you read that in op-ed pages. What was for many years thought to be the reason for the length of the Great Depression was that we didn't have enough money in the system. Whereas Ben Bernanke said that was not the case. Rather, the loss of trust and confidence led the banks to withdraw, to be shy about giving loans and getting the whole economy moving again. So there are some solutions, and uh, we'll just go a few, uh, through some of these. Solutions reducing the risk of financial panics and increasing trust and confidence in investors and lenders in financial institutions. So one that's most familiar to us is the FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. That was started in 1933, one of the first things that Roosevelt did in his presidency. And it allowed insurance of what you had in the bank. And there were a lot of, remember there was a period where there's an enormous run on the banks. Then there was a bank holiday, not much of a holiday for the bankers, but it basically said, nobody can get their money out of the banks until we stabilize this. I don't think I should have looked up how long it lasted, uh, but it lasted for weeks or months. I don't remember because I wasn't around and most of us weren't around. However, in 1933, it guaranteed $2,500 that the government would cover if your bank collapsed. Today, it's $250,000 per individual. If it's a couple, it's $500,000. So that stabilized that aspect of it because you weren't worried about whether the bank could pay you back. If they couldn't, the government would. And the speaker at the award ceremony suggested that came even earlier in Sweden, probably did. I don't know much about Swedish banking. Many regulations and rules that apply to banks, investments, et cetera, were passed by law, as well as many other agencies like the Federal Reserve System back in 1913, uh, the Security and Exchange Commission 1934, the National Credit Union Administration in 1970, and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, just to mention four, and just to show you how many are involved, here's a list of all the or the major banking regulators in the United States, securities regulators, that's the stock market and, uh, and other regulators. And you can see if they're doing their job, but obviously these were all established with the exception of one or two that were established quite late, uh, uh, like the one in 2010, um, something still, could go wrong, and it did in 2008. And so, whoop, wrong button. President Barack Obama wrote uh, in a Promised Land, this is the first of his two volume memoirs of his presidency. He um, describes the terror of addressing the Great Recession, which fell on him, including bailing out General Motors and Chrysler and, and also the process of getting the Dodd-Frank legislation passed. As he said, it involved the same kind of sausage making that had been required to pass the health care bill with a flurry of compromises that often left me privately steaming. Well, this was the result. In 2010, a major overhaul of federal of financial regulations took place and it was named after senator from from um, 
Connecticut, Dodd, I can't remember his first name, and Barney Frank, a Massachusetts uh, congressman, and especially included regulations on banks, including stress tests, whoop, I want to go back, stress tests for banks, especially critical in keeping the larger ones from the risk of bankruptcy. This was uh, quite successful until um, quite recently we had a, a shock to the system. So let me talk about the Silicon Valley Bank, which is the most recent of a couple of bank of, of panics. Any way you look at it, clear example of panics. The bank itself had uh, uh, withholdings of about $210 billion, invested deposits in a very secure long-term treasury bonds, guaranteed return, just fine. Um, but they didn't count on the increase the inflation and, and, and the increase of the interest rates that the Federal Reserve used to try to stamp down on inflation. The cause of inflation, of course, was a whole variety of factors, but supply chain um, and the pandemic, a whole bunch of other factors that couldn't necessarily be predicted, granted. And it made the value of their holdings if you have long-term treasury bonds, it means that you have to wait 10, maybe 20 years to get their full return. The values of the bonds go down, the immediate values of the bonds go down when interest rates go up. And they didn't have. So they were aware of this and um, this kind of a shortfall. And an announcement that the bank had sold $21 billion of securities at, at a bit of a loss just to get liquid assets available and borrowed another $15 billion, got some of the depositors very nervous. Not the depositors that had less than $250,000 per individual, but the depositors of corporations in Silicon Valley, of which there are a lot of them, of high value, millions, in some cases, close to billions. And so news spread. And when news spreads, by the end of the day, suddenly panic ensued with a run on the bank. And I, I think it's either that, 9th or the 10th of March, but that's when it was realized. $42 billion were pulled out in one day. Now you say, well, they had $209 billion. What's the problem? Those monies were being used. A lot of them went into treasury bonds, which was a mistake in hindsight and probably a mistake in foresight. And the others were used for lending out to corporations mortgages, a whole variety of things that banks do with their money. And so the bank had insufficient funds to cover further demands and the bank failed. And of course, those small depositors got guaranteed return. Ultimately, to avoid runs on other mid-size, this bank with holdings of $209 billion is a mid-size bank. The federal government stepped in to cover all potential losses. Now, why did they do that? Because it was a risk to other banks in similar situations having a run on them, and then you would have a serious consequence of the collapse of the whole system. So the bottom line says stress tests on mid-sized banks, which were incorporated, and a stress test is to say, if you hold a certain percentage of treasury bonds, a certain percentage of, of municipal bonds, a certain percentage of short-term treasury bonds, how would you respond to a demand of, uh, for liquid assets? And they do this with banks, especially large banks, but even with mid-sized banks. But in 2018, and I won't name names, legislation passed to loosen, to loosen the uh, 
rules on mid-sized banks, and it may have contributed to this situation. Now, this was not the only bank. There was, uh, and I don't remember the names, Republic Bank and a few other banks, but they had to staunch the bleeding. So that's the overall summary. I wanted to talk, uh, Ben Bernanke presented two lectures to the Nobel Prize week. One we will hear in a moment. The other one were remarks at the Nobel banquet. That's him at the banquet above. Here is the last paragraph, quote, I couldn't find the actual video of this, so I'm quoting his last paragraph. The famous investor, Warren Buffett, once said, it's when the tide goes out that you can see who is swimming naked. Financial crises separate the prepared from the unprepared. Our work and that of many other economists is aimed at assuring both that the financial system is prepared and that the tide doesn't go out very often. So I think this is a way of summing up uh, his contribution. So now we're going to, um, uh, oh, I, two terms. In his Nobel lecture, he uses two terms I just wanted to define here a little clearer. The external finance premium is the all-in cost of a loan to a borrower less the safe rate of interest. So a small business will have a higher external financial premium than a financially strong corporation. So it's in effect what the bank is charging to make an income, which will be passed on to its lenders, uh, which is, I mean, to, to its lenders, yes, which is us who have money in the bank. And then the other term is moral hazard. It's a situation in which one party engages in risky behavior or fails to act in good faith because it knows the other party bears the economic consequences of their behavior. Moral hazards can occur when governments make the decision to bail out large corporations or when borrowers cheat. So that's two terms he'll use. So now we move on. And this is about 30 minutes. And, um, if you have the patience, I do, to listen to his talk. And uh, we will begin right now. And I think we have to press that. Do I press it? OK. Yeah, okay. Ben Bernanke, yeah. born in Augusta, Georgia. He has a PhD from MIT, and now holds a position at the Brookings Institution in Washington. Please, Ben. Uh, thanks very much to the Nobel Prize Committee and uh, to all the organizations that have made this week possible. And thanks to all of you for uh, coming to listen to these, uh, to these lectures. Um, you see the title of my lecture, Banking, Credit, and Economic Fluctuations. Here's kind of an overview of what I'm going to talk about. Now, my basic argument that runs through a lot of my research is that banking and credit markets can become stressed, and I will explain very precisely what I mean by stressed, which leads to increased cost of borrowing and reduced availability of credit. Now, the, the, the important thing is that this credit market stress can have very consequential effects on the macro economy. And I'll do two case studies today. One of them is the Great Depression of the 1930s, and the second is the global financial crisis of 2000, 2007 to 2009. But I, if I have time, I'll talk a little bit about how these ideas have gotten into standard macroeconomics about ordinary business cycles and ordinary monetary policy. So it has been something that has affected uh, standard uh, non-crisis analysis as well as uh, episodes like the global financial crisis. Now, in order to talk about what it means for have a credit market be stressed, we have to talk about the economics of lending. Now, uh, lending is uh, lending markets are different from, say, markets for apples because they involve imperfect information and asymmetric information, meaning that one party to the transaction knows more than the other about the product uh, being sold. In this case, borrowers tend to know more than lenders about their own financial capacity, their own plans, their risks, what they're going to do with the money. Uh, can you imagine uh, if, if this market was one in which 
Uh, for example, banks offered 5% loans for small businesses, and just anyone who wanted to come to the door could take it. Well, would that work? Uh, obviously not. You would have people who were, uh, knew themselves to be very risky uh, to come and take loans, and that's called adverse selection. Or you would have people come and take the loans and use them to play, make parties or to, uh, or to do anything that, other than what they're supposed to do, and that's called moral hazard uh, if you don't have some kind of oversight. So you do need banks or something like banks because what banks do is they uh, overcome these information problems by, uh, by uh, screening borrowers. You have to fill in lots of forms by monitoring them by putting restrictions on what they can do with the money and requiring collateral. So banks, the purpose of banks is to overcome the information problems that permeate uh, lending markets. Now, uh, there's a cost to all this. So the cost of making a loan, uh, again, includes all the costs that the bank incurs in screening, monitoring uh, the, the potential borrowers. Uh, there, a concept I'll be using uh, throughout the lecture is the external finance premium, or the EFP. That's basically the entire cost of making the loan over and above the interest, the pure safe rate of interest that's in the economy. Okay, so think of it as being the, uh, what the bank has to be paid in order to make loans instead of holding safe securities. Uh, now, the EFP, the external finance premium, is borne by the borrower because the lender can always go to the safe treasury market. So different borrowers have different EFPs. Uh, but as you'll see, uh, even though, uh, say, a small business has a higher external finance premium, has to pay more to get a loan than a big business, the EFPs uh, uh, tend to go uh, together when the economy is getting stronger or weaker. And that will be uh, an important concept as we look at the uh, effects on the macroeconomy. Now, it's important to recognize also that we, we talk about borrowers, mortgage borrowers, small business borrowers, but banks themselves are also borrowers. They have to get the funds they, they need to lend to ultimate borrowers. And for reasons that will be discussed uh, by my co-laureates, uh, Diamond and Divvig, they tend to borrow on a short-term basis, uh, deposits or other types of short-term money. Uh, which is valuable to the customers because of the, uh, it's easily converted to cash when it's needed. Um, and uh, it uh, provides uh, a transactions medium in order to buy and sell. So uh, banks tend to rely on, largely on short-term funding, but that makes them vulnerable to runs. Uh, George Bailey, It's a Wonderful Life, uh, his savings and loan came under pressure because people lost confidence in his savings and loan and pulled out their money and forced it uh, to fail. Now, panics are a real concern. Um, it, when, when there's a lot of panics or uh, runs going on, banks become very cautious. They, they stop lending to risky borrowers because they want to maintain uh, confidence. And this is called the flight to quality. Instead, they invest in very safe securities like, like treasury bills. The problem with that is that if banks stop making loans to the private sector, all of this uh, skill they develop, the accumulated information, the relationships, and so on, the, the loan officers, the, uh, the accountants who have, who have developed the information needed to make loans, all of that is essentially being wasted because they're not making loans to the private sector. Now, an important insight here is that for both borrowers and lenders, the external finance premium depends a lot on how wealthy, how well off uh, the both sides of the transaction are. When uh, borrowers have high net worth, uh, they are essentially uh, partners with the bank in their investment. The, the bank the borrower has to bear more of any losses that occur, creates a financial cushion for the bank, and it gives the proper appropriate incentives to the borrower because if they are uh, the owner of a very large fraction of their home or their small business, then their efforts to make the business more successful will give them additional profits uh, as well as the bank, which owns essentially some half or some other fraction. Uh, likewise, uh, when lenders are well off, when banks have lots of capital or cash uh, to absorb losses, then the, the, their funders, 
will be much more confident that the bank is not going to fail, and therefore the bank will not have to worry so much about runs or panics. So again, the, the external finance premium depends on the net worth of both borrowers and lenders. It also relates to the state of the economy. Uh, first, if the external finance premium is very high, that is, it's very costly to make loans to the private sector, that's what I mean by a stressed credit market, uh, a high external finance premium. When that's true, then credit standards become tight, lending becomes uh, scarce, uh, uh, credit is not available, and that obviously is going to slow the economy down. In the other direction, if the economy is weak for whatever reason, maybe an oil price shock or something else, uh, that hits the net worth, the financial health of both lenders and borrowers and makes it more difficult uh, to, to make loans. And so uh, that there's a, uh, a by very relationship, external finance premium is affected by the economy. The economy uh, affects the external finance premium. Now here is a, an attempt to measure the external finance premium. This, is, this happens to be uh, from a paper by uh, Simon Gilchrist and Egon Zakrasek. They, they, they look basically at the difference between the return on corporate bonds, carefully measured, and treasury securities, safe treasury securities of the same maturity. And they show this series going back to the 1970s. The, uh, so a higher, uh, this is a, a proxy for the external finance premium. When, the, when that is a value is high, that shows that the, uh, the credit markets are under tremendous stress. The gray bars refer to periods of recession. And what you can see a couple of things. One is that uh, the external finance premium does tend to go up during recessions, generally. Secondly, that um, uh, the external finance premium has become more volatile over time in part because borrowers have become more dispersed. We have more uh, low-rated uh, low borrowers as well as the, the highest blue-chip borrowers. But notice how the external finance premium responds to crises. Uh, after 2000, uh, in the uh, recession that followed the, uh, the dot-com bust, you see external finance premium rising. And then after the recession, it rose as uh, Enron and WorldCom and other companies came under uh, uh, pressure because of the fraudulent activities they were doing. Now, if you want to see a really high external finance premium, take a look at the global financial crisis in 2007 and 2009. This was saying basically if credit markets were shutting down uh, completely during this period. And then another place, if you look at the last uh, very short recession that began the pandemic, you see a sharp spike around March 2020, which was another uh, financial crisis that the Fed uh, put out pretty quickly. So as, as, let me do a little case study here, which is the Great Depression. Now, over the last 25 years, a lot of work has suggested that the Great Depression of the 1930s, which of course was a very consequential event, uh, was, was caused in significant part by a malfunctioning gold standard. Before World War I, most countries tied their currencies to gold, and that kept exchange rates fixed and promoted trade, etc. The gold standard was uh, uh, suspended during the war, and after the war, they tried to reconstruct the gold standard system. But for various reasons, which would take me too far afield, there were structural flaws in the new gold standard. And moreover, because there was a lot of residual hostility between France and Germany, for example, after the war, uh, countries didn't work together to, um, uh, to make the gold standard work. And so the gold standard collapsed in the late 20s and early 30s. It brought down the money supplies around the world, and that in turn brought down prices. So we're having inflation today. Well, in the 1930s, they had deflation. Prices were falling. Um, and some evidence that the gold standard was important, and I've worked on this myself. Uh, I've been very interested in the Depression for a long time. But very simple evidence is that countries that, for whatever reason, left the gold standard relatively earlier like Great Britain, Japan, and the Scandinavian countries, uh, recovered from the Depression much more quickly than those that stayed on the gold standard late into the 1930s, like France and Switzerland. So that's, again, that's become a very central idea in the explanation of the Depression, but there's still problems and questions to be answered. What, what was the mechanism? Why did deflations fall, uh, lead to big uh, declines in output? Why was the recovery so slow in the United States and other countries? Well, I would argue that the credit market stress, along with the gold standard, was a very important cause of the Depression. 
there was certainly a lot of credit market stress in the 1930s. In the United States, uh, we had something at that time of something like 20, uh, 25,000 banks. We had very, very large numbers of very small banks, uh, a few large ones. Uh, about 40% of those banks disappeared between uh, 1929 and 1933. By disappeared, they failed, closed, or were absorbed by other banks. So, and that happened because there was massive runs, bank runs, that where people lost confidence in the banks and pulled out their money, and um, that made banks, of course, the ones that, the ones that were closed couldn't make loans, obviously, and the ones that survived became extremely cautious, uh, being very reluctant to make loans to the economy. Likewise, on the debtor side, there was massive uh, insolvency and delinquency. Let me point to these first two bullets here. The first one is uh, a survey in 1933 looking at 22 cities showed mortgage delinquency rates ranging from 21% to 62% of homeowners had, were behind on their payments. Uh, secondly, about half of all farm mortgage debt was delinquent in 1933. So this is far worse than what we saw after the global financial crisis. Uh, borrowers, private borrowers were uh, in, in very bad shape and unable to make uh, payments on their loans. And surveys of banks showed that what they were trying to do was not to make loans, but rather to liquidate the existing loans, call them in, um, and to refuse to make any new loans except to the very, very safest borrowers, of which there weren't that many. So uh, between what was happening to the banks, the runs, and what was happening to borrowers, the credit market was basically shutting down. Now, this uh, helps explain a lot of interesting facts about the Depression. I won't go through all of these, but let me talk about the last four quickly. Uh, first, in the United States, there was a 30% decline in prices between 1931 and 33. Why was that so damaging? Well, one of the reasons was the effects on borrowers. Suppose you're a farmer, you owe a certain amount every month on your mortgage, and the prices of the things you grow, your commodity prices, are falling by 30, 40, 50, 60%. How are you going to make your payments? You're going to go into default. Um, so the decline in prices had its effects on the economy by putting many, many borrowers into very bad situations. A strong recovery began in 1933 when Franklin Roosevelt became president. In my opinion, Fro Roosevelt did exactly two things that made the economy better. Uh, all the programs, all the you know, Works Project Administration, all that stuff was small potatoes. What was important was first, that he weakened or, or eliminated the, re the relationship of the dollar to gold, got off the gold standard, that was very important. But the other thing he did was he stabilized the banking system. He, shortly after he became president, he called a, quote, a bank holiday, and all the banks had to shut down, and he promised the American public that they wouldn't open up until the government had inspected them and was confident that they were in, in viable condition. And then the Congress passed uh, a deposit insurance, so that small depositors would be guaranteed that even if their bank failed, the government would pay them off. And that led to instantaneously to a st stabilization of the banking system. And that, of course, uh, as, as the banking system became uh, workable, that led to uh, help lead to, lead to recovery. Now, the recovery also, even after the gold, going off the gold in 1933, the recovery was very slow. When the United States entered World War II in late 1941, the unemployment rate was still 15% in the United States, very high. So it was a very slow recovery, why? Well, I would argue that on the one hand, banks, although they were no longer failing, they were still very, very cautious, and borrowers were still in very, very bad financial shape. It took a long time for them to work out their debt problems, and for that reason, credit was uh, constricted, and that kept the economy from recovering more quickly. And, and finally, just uh, some other work that I did with a historian at Princeton named Harold James, we looked at 24 different countries uh, and compared them uh, how serious their, their banking crises were, and we found evidence that country, all else equal, that countries where the banking system remained stable, and that included Sweden, uh, Japan, the Netherlands, uh, that they did better uh, than countries where there were severe banking crises like uh, Germany, Austria, and the United States. Uh, so clearly, that across countries, there was some evidence that the, the collapse of the banking system was uh, a cause of the depression. Second case study, the Great Recession of 2007-2009. Uh, I, I argued that the depression was the product of really two main forces, the gold standard and the financial crisis or the 
breakdown of credit markets, I'm going to argue that the breakdown of credit markets was basically the main reason for the 2007-2009 recession and for the very slow recovery that followed. Now, there were changes in the financial system uh, between 1929 and 2007. Um, in the United States, uh, many, many uh, financial institutions that were not officially banks uh, grew up, mortgage, uh, mortgage companies, consumer finance companies, investment banks, money market mutual funds, securitizations, off balance sheet vehicles, I could go on for a while. All these uh, companies or vehicles were created that did lending or held credit instruments, but they were not banks. And the fact that they were not banks meant that they were not eligible for deposit insurance. But nevertheless, they still, uh, they still financed themselves by using short-term funding, uh, which meant that they were vulnerable to runs, potentially. Now, everybody knows about the subprime mortgages and how disastrous they were. But the, what, why were they so disastrous? One of the things that, that confused us at the Federal Reserve was that subprime mortgages were not a large asset class. One of our staff c calculated that if all the subprime mortgages in the world went to zero in one day, it would be like a bad day in the stock market. It would be almost nothing. The reason the subprime mortgages were so damaging was because they were sprinkled essentially throughout the financial system. They, they were held in the portfolios of banks and shadow banks. They were, there were many derivative instruments that were tied to uh, uh, subprime mortgages. There were securitizations that included subprime mortgages and on and on and on. And what happened was that uh, the investors, particularly in shadow banks, but also in commercial uh, chartered banks, became very fearful that, that their particular institution was very exposed to subprime and other bad mortgages. And so there was an ongoing uh, run, maybe a slow run in some cases, on these types of institutions, uh, which in turn led them to dump their assets on the market because they didn't have the cash to, to, uh, to make those loans, which led to what's called fire sales. The fire sales, so emergency sales of, of credit, really knocked down the price of credit instruments, raised interest rates on on credit uh, and brought not, not just the shadow banks, but even many major commercial banks in, the, in Europe, of course, as well as in the United States, close to the brink of insolvency. Now, borrowers did come under great stress uh, in, in, the, in the global financial crisis. In the United States, there was a housing bubble. Uh, when the housing bubble burst, then many uh, mortgages holders or homeowners were, quote, underwater, that is, their mortgage value was bigger than the price of their house. And so in the United States, when that happens, you can go to the bank and say, here's the key, I'm leaving. You know, you don't have to pay off the, the, the remaining part. And that happened a lot. Um, delinquency rates rose sharply and, and, and people uh, stopped spending, consumer spending dropped. Uh, there was also a lot of delinquency in, uh, in, among businesses. But even, of course, the small businesses were badly hit because they couldn't get credit. But even very large businesses had difficulty. Uh, you, you may remember that the US government had to rescue uh, uh, General Motors and Chrysler because they were about to fail. So um, as in the Depression, the, the stress of credit markets led to uh, the downturn. I would argue that the very severe recession of uh, 2007, 2009 and the slow recovery now, there's no particular reason why, on the one hand, the lender's side or the borrower's side should be the most important. But I would argue that in this particular episode, 2007-2009, uh, the global financial crisis, it was the financial panic that put the financial markets and financial institutions on the brink of failure that was the more important factor in terms of why the recession was so bad. Um, particularly after Lehman Brothers collapsed in September of 2008, there was basically a, a complete shutdown of our financial lenders, financial institutions, and that had, of course, very, very negative effects on the economy. A bit of evidence here from a paper I wrote in 2018 for, at the Brookings Institution. Uh, the black line uh, shows you the actual path of US GDP, real GDP, the gray bar is the recession, so you can see GDP falling during the recession. There are the blue line, uh, which I call panic indicators, that is essentially the forecast of output that comes when you use variables related to the financial panic, the things that were affecting uh, lenders, like the 
cost of funds to banks, for example, or the price of, uh, of uh, credit uh, uh, securitizations. And what you can see, and this, these are actually very uh, far ahead forecasts, the panic indicators, that is the, the indicators of stress in the lenders, forecast the GDP extremely well. Whereas the, what I call the delinquency indicators, which are measures of you know, how, what rate of the mortgage borrowers were, were failing to pay, uh, is correlated with the actual GDP, but is much weaker. So I'm not saying this is a general result, but in this particular episode, it was the crisis on Wall Street that was more important than the stress, as dangerous and as uh, damaging as it was, uh, on, on consumers and homeowners. So what, is, what are the implications of that? Well, one of them is that if the, you know, if the financial system is collapsing uh, in the 1930s until Roosevelt, they didn't do anything about it. So uh, you know, it went on and on, and it brought the credit markets down. Uh, one of the lessons I think we learned from the Depression is we have to not allow that to happen. And the Federal Reserve and the Treasury worked very hard to uh, stop the financial crisis and to get the financial uh, institutions lending again. Uh, now that's after the fact, that's after you have the crisis. Uh, it's better not to have the crisis in the first place. And how do you do that? Well, I think it's very important to have strong financial regulation that makes sure that the financial institutions are safe and sound, meaning they have very good capital, that they have safe portfolios, that they are not taking excessive risks, and so on. Uh, and you should have a macroprudential approach, meaning that you should be looking not just at individual institutions, but thinking about the entire system uh, and what, how problems in one part of the system can affect other parts. My, my sense is that globally, since the crisis uh, and the Great Recession, that uh, regulation has made, has been a lot of progress, particularly for commercial banks. Uh, in the United States, commercial banks hold a lot more capital than they did. They are more liquid. They, have, uh, they do stress testing to make sure that they're not uh, holding overly risky assets. My, my concern is that uh, the shadow banks, which were the original source of the crisis, there's been some regulatory change, but not nearly enough, in my opinion. And that is, I think, a problem that's still there. And we saw that in March of 2020, when there was a very sharp but short financial crisis, which came primarily from the shadow banks. So I think that's a lesson of this whole experience, and we need to um, do something about that uh, regulatory uh, area. I have, I'm close to the end here. I don't know how much time I have, uh, but I will talk a little bit about how uh, this research has entered into the um, mainstream macroeconomics, how it becomes part of ordinary business cycle analysis. And I'll talk about two, uh, one page each, uh, one uh, slide each on two topics. The first one is that these models of credit stress can help explain why recessions tend to last as long as they do. Even if there's a once and for all shock, a recession will tend to last for a while. And the reason for it is, I, I would argue, is that when there's a shock to the economy, say again, an energy crisis, that drives down uh, income and wealth, that increases the external finance premium in the economy, that is it makes it harder, credit markets become uh, less efficient, borrowers are more stressed, banks uh, are becoming more conservative. That reduces the availability of credit and that amplifies the shock. It makes the economy weaken even longer than the initial shock did. And, and likewise, in the other direction, if there's a positive shock to the economy, that makes borrowers and lenders better off that reduces the external finance premium uh, and makes the economy uh, even, even stronger. So credit factors or credit stress in credit markets tend to amplify rece ordinary recessions and ordinary booms, uh, a phenomenon which uh, we have dubbed, my co-authors and I, Mark Gertler and Simon Gilchrist, have dubbed the financial accelerator because the financial markets accelerate the effects of shocks in the economy. And uh, Mark and Simon and I have created a uh, a macro, a econometric macro model that incorporates these factors and found that we could better um, match the data, match the, the, uh, the uh, actual behavior of the economy uh, with a model like that. Uh, a second thing that we've done uh, that related to ordinary uh, macroeconomics is looking at how monetary policy affects the economy. Monetary policy seems to be quite powerful. 
uh, and there are periods where it has had very big effects, particularly during tightening channels, uh, tight, uh, tightening uh, uh, episodes. And that's a little puzzling because, for example, uh, studies of big firms' investments show that they're not that responsive to short-term interest rates. So what is it that's making the economy slow down when the, when the Fed raises interest rates or the Bank of uh, Rick's Bank raises interest rates? Well, the, the, this, these theories uh, give us something to call the credit channel of monetary policy. And the idea, once again, is that if the Fed raises interest rates and slows the economy, that's going to tend to um, uh, raise the external finance premium by making borrowers and lenders um, worse off, you know, by reducing employment, by reducing profits, and so on. And that, in turn, will affect the economy. So that's a channel through which uh, monetary policy can affect the economy. Um, so that's another place where uh, these, these theories have been, I think, helpful in understanding the ordinary macroeconomy. So I've come to my conclusion, uh, which is that, first, uh, a lot of this might sound very familiar to you by now, but when I was 40 years ago, when I was 29 years old, and I wrote the, the paper that was cited by the Nobel Committee, um, there was uh, very little attention paid to um, financial instability as a factor in macroeconomics. George Akerlof, a Nobel winner, uh, wrote a, a, a very interesting historical paper arguing that that uh, the macro schools of thought, like the Keynesian school of thought, for example, did had no place for financial instability as one of the factors affecting the economy. So in particular, uh, and I tell you this from personal experience, when the financial crisis hit in 2008, the Federal Reserve's models consistently underestimated the impact on the economy because it was, they were not prepared to take into account the full effect of, uh, of uh, stressed credit markets. Uh, so obviously, so to understand the effects of financial crises on the economy, we have to understand these relationships. And as I've argued, uh, that uh, looking at variations in the effectiveness of uh, credit markets can also help us understand more normal circumstances. You know, right now the Fed is tightening interest rates. That presumably is affecting, making credit markets more stressed. That uh, is one of the reasons why our economy in the United States is slowing down. Now, what the last... We can stop there. Let me just uh, have you, let's all watch the Fed and see uh, how inflation is impacted by raising interest rates. It's interesting that he, dis he seems to argue that uh, um, lend, uh, banks get gun shy and kind of slow the whole system up. And by having support from the federal government, as the government did support those failing banks a month ago or so, creates an environment that doesn't lead to the financial accelerator making a bad event worse by continuing this. Uh, but you know, recessions and panics will come about in the future. It's nothing that stops them. The question is how we can soften the landing, as they say, and soften the impact. So I hope I had prepared you for his talk. And um, next week, we're going to be talking about the Peace Prize. We're going to go to Oslo in Norway and see a different ceremony and talk about three amazing organizations that won the Peace Prize in, 19, in, in 2022. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you again, John.